And so now to our Winter Sports Masterclass. In this session, we'll hear how producers, directors and broadcasters approach their sports coverage of a whole range of winter sports disciplines, including alpine and Nordic skiing, biathlon, rallying and many more. Explaining the challenges they face, best practice and how they see winter sports production involving in the years ahead. Well, with me, three of the very best. Uh, Florian Ruth, Director of Content and Production at WRC World Rally Championships. Also, Edlund Jonsson, uh, SVT's Head of uh, Sports. And uh, Michael Kergler joins us again, ORF's uh, Head of Directors. Welcome to you all. And uh, to all of you watching, don't forget, if you have questions for our panel, please use Zoom chat. Well, welcome to you all. Let's begin with uh, my first uh, observation. All of you are all year round broadcasters of many different sports, but for each of you, what is it that sets apart the production of uh, winter sports? Maybe Florian, uh, you can come in first on this. Um, hello, David, first, hello, everybody. Um, obviously, I mean, on, on winter sport, um, First, also in, in uh, comparison, at, in our case at the World Rally Championship, uh, to other um, events, it's um, obviously the weather has a great impact. Um, it snow snow covers a lot when when you see the beautiful landscapes. Uh, snow just looks amazing. Um, so that's that's a different the look and feel. Um, but um, winter winter has some pros and cons as well. So the people are more challenged in the winter, um, but also on the other side, on in the case of world rallying, the uh, the cars go really really fast on snow with the starts. Um, the the snow rallies are some of uh, of the fastest of the calendar. So there's a lot of uh, a lot of good and bad for for world rallying on the winter. Good and also your thoughts on on the differences. I can just fill in on what Florian just said. I think that the biggest the challenges we have with winter sport is is mother nature. Uh, we have uh, we have Alpine World Championships right now. It was postponed due to weather conditions. You have the the World Juniors in, in cross country in Finland. It was postponed due to cold. So 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 mother nature is always haunting us when it comes to winter sports. But then again, it's all all uh, always spectacular with the snow as well. So, so uh, I'm just underlining Florian here. Indeed, um, as you've probably all noticed, uh, Michael not quite with us, but hopefully uh, he'll be joining us uh, momentarily. So let's just move on a little bit more about that particular topic mm -hmm. and um, having a look at what's different um, and are there any common factors in televising uh, winter sports? Uh, welcome, Michael. Good to have you with us. Thank you. Um, so just just out talking here. about uh, uh, televising winter sports, um, are we have? Do we have common factors? Uh, obviously, we have differences, but are there any common factors generally? Michael, would you like to come in on that? Yes. Um, winter sports, to my mind, is a complete different setup than all the other sports we are used to. Because if uh, you step out on a slope like this uh, in Kitzbühel or other events, it's uh, being out on a mountain under rough conditions. And it's totally different if you compare it to some sports like soccer or indoor arenas, where you have a complete setup. Here you have to find on each different mountain a different setup, on each different location, on each different jumping hill, on each different cross country. So. It's a, every of these events is a unique uh, setup of cameras and a unique setup of cameras you're going to use. So we always try to use uh, all the state of the art setup, which is possible at the moment and to improve all the time. But uh, it's not a setup you can, if you go to a soccer field, you can just choose if you have 16, 25 or 35 cameras. They will, in each arena, they will be on the same spot 
just depending how many you are. It's also the same if you look at a Flow Roots Rally. You always have to look where you have the best angles, where you have the best shots. It's a different um, way of presenting the sport and it's a different challenge to find the right positions for the broadcast. But but also if I can just uh, fill in, you also have sure. you also have like sports like ski jumping. You have the big air. You have snowmobile. That's an arena sports. You also have the arena sports. So so the variety of winter sports is so huge. So so when working with directors, for instance, you really have to have a big variety of directors as well who can cope with the challenges uh, challenges that Michael faces, but also other challenges. Indeed, very good point, uh, Orsa. And Florian, just coming back to uh, something you mentioned already at the beginning, um, dealing with speed, and I'd like to also bring in here the concept of the steepness of, say, both uphills and downhills in cross-country, but also in, in rallying, in biathlon. In a lot of sports, we have gradient as a factor, which is a real challenge for any director. Um, it is it is a challenge gradient, but of course the speed as well. Um, so when I when I talk about uh, world rally, what we what we do to show the speed, obviously we have the the onboard cameras. We we use the very low bumper cameras in front to show the high speed. Uh, we use very uh, very fast sections to fly very low with a helicopter to really show the speed. And we have the advantage compared to um, to when Michael produces uh, skiing, that we always have a reference. We have trees very, very close by. So with those references, you really see the speed. And you also, with the references, and also in comparison comparison with the, with the ground cameras we have, the, uh, the onboard cameras, the helicopter, we also can show the different elevations. But I think the key is, is the speed. And there, we have the advantage of the reference. I think what, uh, what Michael, um, needs to needs to cover with special camera angles and special camera positions to really show some kind of fore and background and uh, also just coming to you i know that uh, you regard biathlon as one of the toughest sports to present yes well i wouldn't want to be the director of a biathlon <laughs> i mean you have you have 30 athletes coming into to the shooting range at, at basically the same time and you have no idea what what uh, where the drama will end who will who will make a perfect uh, shot who will fail who will leave the shooting range first and really do a great storytelling around that i think that's that's super challenging for for any director is that when I, you talk I, to your director I, I Sorry, saw it uh, jump in. I totally agree yeah. as I'm doing a lot of biathlon and also the Olympics. Uh, it is, for me, biathlon is for sure the most challenging broadcast you can have on TV uh, compared to shows to everything. Because it, especially in a sprint or in the individual race, there are, if, you have a, if you take an individual race or a sprint, especially within an hour, you can take 1,000 different decisions where to go to. If you think you have 100 athletes, 100 athletes at the start, at the first intermediate, second intermediate, first shooting, third intermediate, fourth, fifth, uh, next shooting, and another three times into the finish without having shown any slow-mo, anything else. And especially in the sprint, you have to have luck too, because if the guy, who you were focusing and thinking, or the athlete, not the guy, or the woman too, uh, is missing the final target, and the athlete next to him hits all five targets, and it's the big winner. Everybody says, ah, why didn't you take the other one? It was clear that he's going to win. So this is also a little bit of luck sometimes on a, on a bad one. So we have a lot of um, technology these days at our disposal. Um, Florian, you've already uh, alluded to some of the technology that you use. Michael, also, we've got wire cams, drones, um, onboard cameras, mini cameras, remote cameras, and also this increase of usage with microphones, uh, which seems to be something which is 
really very topical at the moment to have that sense of sound brought into the productions. Uh, Michael, again, um, and, and also, is that something which you and your colleagues are looking at in terms of increasing the element of sound within the production? I think it's an enormous support for the drama and the emotion to have a great sound. So this is the reason why we really invest a lot of money into getting a bigger sound and a better sound than we had. And uh, if you look at the biathlon just mentioned before, you have 30 lanes where they can shoot. And to get this breathing of the athletes when they lay down for the shooting, you have to have 30 mics, uh, you have a mic on each lane. And you have a mic uh, at, at each of the targets at the end when they're hitting with the bullet target to get this typical sound. So this is a lot of investment for each broadcaster to do. And, and talked, I think uh, it has been it has been even more important for us during this COVID period because you don't have the audience, so you really, really want to get close to, to the sports and to the action, and then you need the sound. So I think the improvement that has been done this season in winter sports when it comes to sound, I think we will bring that on to next coming seasons because it has enhanced the, the experience. Indeed, it's been... Um the situation where some broadcasters have felt it um, a good idea to bring in some sort of artificial sound. How do you feel about that, uh, bringing artificial crowd into the productions at the moment whilst we're under the COVID uh, restrictions? I think there is a difference. We had, we had the same um, experience in Kitzbühel, uh, but Compared to the soccer games where they just uh, play fr uh, songs from the archive and give them applause from the archive, uh, there was a sound system created where the fans really could give their live emotions uh, to us and we added it to the sound. So we had the really reaction of the crowd at home regarding the athlete who was on course. And then it's like a little bit of a life thing because if you do add sounds in a clear, empty stadium, normally I don't like it, to be honest. Can we just um, go for a moment from the outdoor, uh, the outdoor winter sports into indoors for a moment? Uh, also, uh, Sweden, very successful at ice hockey. I've always regarded that as uh, a real challenge for a director because of the just the sheer pace of the game. Yeah, it is. It is challenging, but but I must say, I, I used to be a hockey commentator myself and worked very close with the director to make a great storytelling. So I think that was the most important thing for me, being a hockey commentator, working close to, so you can actually address things in the in the right way. But but. I don't think ice hockey can be compared to winter sports and especially not with, with biathlon because biathlon is so complex compared to ice hockey because you're in the arena and you have control of the arena uh, in an easier way. But, but then again, you know, it's fast. So, Indeed. And coming outdoors again, there's a, a number of sports where uh, particularly uh, the sliding centers uh, where there's uh, a lot of work uh, that they're looking at these days on identifying the curves, the G-force that's involved both in luge skeleton and also in bobsleigh to try and convey uh, what's happening inside the bob or inside or on the sledge to the viewer at home, the speed and particularly the sort of the G-force on the different turns. Is that something where you believe we've still got plenty of room for improvement? I would say yes, because, I would say yes yeah. because if you look at the MotoGP performance graphic-wise, where you see on the onboards the angle he is going into the corners and the, uh, the speed and the G-force, this is brilliantly done and gave a lot of improvement to the broadcast of the MotoGP. And uh, we are all trying to find solutions like this, but they are costive 
and cost a lot of money. So we have to look if we are able to manage it, to get it into sports, which are not worldwide sports like MotoGP, Formula One and others. Another uh, question to come up is uh, really about how we bring the personality of the athletes uh, more strongly to the audience. I've had a question in from Konrad Bartelski, former great downhill skier, about uh, bringing personalities in uh, from that particular sport. But I think it applies to probably across the board, whether it's cross-country skiing or ski jumping or indeed uh, rallying. How do we increase the personalities of the athletes that are participating? Thoughts on that? Well, I think you have to plan uh, each uh, competition and production like a scripted drama. I mean, obviously, uh, the competition is, is the heart of sports and, and you had the production. So, so that's the heart of sports. But you really have to bring your production staff together with the content staff and really try to do the scripted drama. And then you need to have the player profiles uh, the athletes and really try to see the the thread uh, from from A to B, like like you're telling a story around the bonfire. And I think you need to have your production crew agree with the content crew how to tell that story to the audience to make the competition more exciting. Florian, what about your chaps in in high speed cars whizzing around and helmets? And how much more do we? How much more can you bring to us of? of who they are and what they're about. Florian, did you uh, catch me? Oh, maybe not. Um, I'll just come to Michael for a moment. Same sort of question, uh, particularly downhill skiers in helmets, uh, Michael. Um, they're yeah, pretty this, covered this up. So this, this is going to be the big disadvantage of skiing and all those things. Who are the big heroes at our time? Soccer players, tennis players, golf players, and even of the Formula One field of these 20 athletes, you don't know all of them because they're also wearing helmets. Uh, so I do not understand sometimes, uh, for example, in skiing, when we try to shoot the pip draw, we want them without the helmets, without the sponsors, just the face, because that's what the people want to see. They want to see their eyes, they want to see the hair color and all those things. But if you're wearing all the time a helmet, a cap or something like this, this gets lost and you're losing your personality. And this is, I think, one of the biggest disadvantages of the winter sports at the moment, because for the personalities, the, you have to see the really people and not some helmet because if you look now on a ski course to find athletes we look them up by the sponsors of the helmets because otherwise they they're wearing the mask they're wearing their goggles they're covered all over you don't know who the person is behind all those uh, things this is really really something which have to change quickly i was really also thinking about um or also even more background, you know, who they are from their homes and their families. Uh, I think this is of great interest to people. I don't mean being intrusive or over nosy, if you understand me, but just uh, learning how they are as a human being, you know, what makes them tick. I think you need to use all the tools in the toolbox uh, when it comes to, to getting the audience to, to, to know the athletes. And, and that comes to interviews and graphics and, and close-ups and, and behind the scenes before the competition and after the competition. And, and I think when it comes to winter sports and you compare it to, to football, for instance, I mean, you get to know the football players instantly. And it's very easy on TikTok or, or on YouTube to, to like a goal that, that Messi is scoring. But it's super uh, difficult to, to like Teresa Yu hug when she's skating and you can't see her face and, you know, you don't get that personality. So I think for young younger viewers, it's... It's difficult to, to really get to know the, the winter sport athletes unless we all get together and, and uh, um, show them on, on television in, in a better way and not with all the sponsors and helmets and glasses and the masks, as Michael is saying. 
yeah, Florian, are you um, are you are you with us? Well, how how would you address that in terms of your drivers, or how do you address that in terms of your drivers? No, exactly what what Osa and Michael just said. The difficulty also at rally is to show the drivers underneath the helmets. So um, the good thing at rally is they are not fully face covered. They're they're just half covered, so you see a bit more emotion. Um, but, but still, we want to look under the under the helmet. So so we show as as uh, a lot of the broadcasts do show show the guys without helmet before the start, and then obviously try to to give the viewer as much information during the drive. And the the big advantage at the rally is right at the at the stop line when they when they come to the stop line, they take off the helmet and we see the guys. We see the guys and we hear the emotions right away. And this is a big advantage. And obviously, during the drive, we have the conversation between driver and the co-driver uh, all the time. So when something happens, is it a, a good moment, a bad moment, or some reaction? We have it live on television. And um, I think that that's the difficulty. And that's what uh, what Michael said before in the session. If he could do this during skiing as well, really to to hear them, to hear them breathing, to hear them screaming. And and really get even closer onto the helmet. I think that's the key for really for really showing personalities during during all kind of of winter sports. Now there's also um, the question in many winter sports. Uh, you have uh, the difference between what we call uh, a repetitive sports, where it's essentially one athlete after another, as opposed to for example, in cross-country skiing, mass starts. And there's a very different appeal uh, to the audience uh, with regard to those disciplines. Uh, maybe uh, we get an older audience uh, also for the more traditional individual starts, which are more popular, perhaps more understood in your part of the world, um, in Norway, excuse me, uh, Norway, Finland, and Sweden, as opposed to Central Europe. Uh, this is always uh, something of a dilemma in terms of continuing participation of countries. But I think I think if you want to find new audience and if you want to have kids watching winter sports, for instance, uh, cross country in the future, you need to look at the formats because I wouldn't have get uh, my 13 year old girl. She wouldn't invest 90 minutes in an individual start on cross country. Because she, ha she has no idea who's going to win the race. But if you have the mass start, at least you know that's the person crossing the finish line first. That's number one. So I think winter sports in general will have to look at the formats for the future to make uh, younger uh, uh, kids and, and make them understand the sports in a better way. I, for one, I grew up watching, you know, uh, cross country with individual starts and I love it. But, hey, I'm, I'm getting old. Not really. Um, let's move on to uh, something else about how you uh, make up your teams, because uh, not everybody likes cold weather. Not everybody can ski or indeed skate. So um, how do you go about uh, crewing up and finding those experts who can really work sometimes in really extreme conditions? Let's uh, kick off with you, Michael. I had the pleasure to build up a group of 100 persons for the Olympics in, in Korea. And it's really not difficult, but you have to know the people. And nowadays, as everybody's looking for budgets and all those things, you have to have people who love it, who have the same passion as you have, and you have the same goals as you have. And you have to bring to bring them all together and you have to try in your team to find the top guys for each position, the top sound guys, the top EVS operators and for sure the top camera guys. And in winter sport, especially in Alpine, you have to have guys who are able to get to those positions where you want to have them. Because it's difficult, as I was mentioning before at the beginning of our show, how difficult it is nowadays to run one of these courses. And for sure, it's also difficult. It's cold out there. It's nasty. It's snowing. Maybe it's raining. It's, it's sometimes under really horrible conditions. It's like 
not like in a warm indoor arena where you go there and know that you have just a 90 minute game. Uh, you might be out there for six, seven hours if the weather is forcing to postpone the race. And this is really, really important to have a perfect crew where everybody is able to do his job and knows and likes it and loves it and has the passion to do it. Also, anything to add to that? No, but I think nowadays so much sport is produced that, that the people working as cameramen, for instance, they get specialized into certain sports. So, so I mean, we just pick specialists for winter sports when we when we do productions on winter sports. For instance, we do the world championships in, in ski cross right now. Then we pick the best uh, men and women for, for the job. And, and they, that's people who has been out there working in snow many, many times. Florian, what about your uh, camera crew? Because they're, they're dealing with uh, very high speed action, as we alluded to earlier. Yes, obviously, for, for that kind of high speed action, you need to select the right cameraman. You need to select the cameraman who have the experience. Um, who can work with fast motorsports like this. And then in, in addition, we have, we have the whole variety in our championship. We have the winter events, um, for example, the event coming up now with the Arctic Rally with temperatures up to minus 50 and minus 20 degrees. Um, but then we go to locations where we have um, plus 40 degrees. So it's, um, it's the big, big variety. But obviously for, for now the winter rallies to find the guys who have the ability to shoot those fast cars, but also to cope with the conditions. For now, at the Arctic Rally, I, for example, need cameraman who who know how to um, how to operate a skido and something like this, and also are good motorsport cameraman. So there there are really not not uh, too many guys um, on the market who always fits every job. So um, as Arthur said, you need to find. Um, to find always the right people for the right spot in your production. And uh, just to um, rewind slightly, Michael, there's a question that's coming for you particularly from uh, Oliver Moser. He's asking or referring to the fact that you mentioned that you've added a sound designer to your team this year. And uh, he's asking if you can just expand on that a little bit about, you know, how it worked and what he's achieved for you. He has achieved uh, to really make the sound uh, better than it was before. He, we added microphones for sure, but he was really taking care of the mix between the sound, the crashes of the skis on the snow, on these icy conditions, uh, to give more power uh, to, the, to the jumps when they hit to the ground, all those things. just using all those tools which you have nowadays on sound to work with and to make the impression better than it was before. Good. I uh, hope that uh, helps. Um, I want to come on to uh, attracting uh, and indeed increasing audiences of all ages. It's always has been, it always will be a challenge. So uh, maybe also uh, we'll come to you first on this one. Uh, is it the ratings that mainly determine what you show or are there other factors? Uh, right now we have uh, fantastic ratings. We're actually uh, setting records in, in broadcast, in linear TV, uh, as well as on our streaming platform. And who would imagine that you could actually put a, a viewing record on linear TV in 2021? But in Sweden, uh, everybody wants to watch sports now, uh, being inside uh, due to COVID. So, so uh, uh, if, if I could build on that for the future, that would be great. Uh, unfortunately, I think people want to go back outside when, when COVID is, is over. And then, then again, it will be challenging to, to, to uh, get the big crowds around TV again. And especially, and I mentioned this a couple of times, uh, the, the, the next generation of TV viewers because they are not used to invest so many hours into to sports on TV because they are used to highlights and short clips on, on TikTok and, and, and YouTube. And I think we together uh, with the federations and the athletes needs to find formats that really works 
for the next generation so we can be successful in many more years to come. Yeah, you mentioned uh, COVID-19. Obviously, it's with us now and it's likely to be with us for quite a while longer, despite the vaccination programs going on. Um, so far this season, how, um, to what degree um, have you managed it? I mean, it's been done really successfully, but um, Florian, uh, your team, COVID-19, how have you managed? Um, when we came back um, after the lockdown last year, obviously we had to, to work with the FIA um, for for the the respective COVID guidelines to make the events happen, but to make them safe. Um, so on site, the production has changed a lot. Um, we, with the organizers and the FIA, have have introduced we call it the the low and high density systems. So everything inside the pits, inside the service park, is the high density area, and outside at the stages is the low density area. So people should not mix. So everyone every team, our TV crew and so on, stay in the bubbles. So just interact on a day-to-day -day basis with the same people. What obviously means a complete change for our production. We had people going out to the stages, coming back to service park, operating more or less everywhere in the studio, uh, out at the stages. Likewise, this all was not possible. Then obviously, as all other productions, we had to split the OB van, um, just really have the director and, and uh, um, the main people in the gallery and uh, and try to move everything out in isolated containers so to have the less people as possible working together um, it changed a lot but um, it's all doable um, we needed a, a few weeks a few months to prepare this get this ready and now um, we've proved for uh, six events already that the system works it's a lot of effort for everybody it's a lot of tests and uh, a lot of commitment, um, but yeah, but that's, as you said, the new re reality at the moment. Also, you've had uh, a lot of good experience with, I think, with remote production, but uh, to what extent has it increased your costs? Well, we, we were actually uh, first in the world to, to make a full remote production from the London Olympics in 2012. And, and uh, back then, we broadcasted every single second from the Olympics. And, and today, everybody does that. But, but in 2012, people didn't. And we could do that and still reduce our costs with almost $1 million back in 2012. So we are also used to working remote at SVT. So for us, it hasn't been too much um, of an adjustment during COVID because we do remote basically all the time. So, so people are very used to, used to this uh, uh, remote production. I mean, we would have preferred to have the studios on site for the world championships. Now we have the studio in Stockholm that works perfectly, just having reporters and photographers on, on site and, and bringing home extra feeds to, to get a great feeling in the studio. But, but I think, I think being so used to working remote as we have been has really helped us. And we even did the Ora and the Alpine and, and um, Bileton World Championship in 2019 uh, remote on IP. So, so this is something that is not new to us. Michael, a, a question to you about uh, commentators, uh, being one myself as well. Um, I think it's really important when we can to still try to get commentators out on site to, as it were, have that first-hand experience, that opportunity to feel the wind, feel the temperature, and when they can, actually with their own eyes, uh, pick up the direct information to bring the feeling of the competition home to the audience. Yeah, I'm, I'm quite old fashioned in this way. I also like to go to the field of play to have the thing to look around. For example, a soccer game. I can sit here like I'm doing now and direct a soccer game in Brazil or all over the world because it's everywhere the same. But the feeling to go inside the stadium and to look around and maybe catch something which you don't see when you're at home uh, for sure, there are a hundred times it doesn't make a difference. 
but there is this certain moment where it makes a difference if you have seen it. And skiing will never be, I think, a thing for a remote production. Although you did it in Aura, I know, but as a director, you always have to be on the hill. I have to adjust the camera of the uh, setting of the handheld cameras, and I have to go down the slope and talk uh, with the race directors if anything is changing. So it's not possible that someone other is going to do that for me. And I'm sitting somewhere and doing the cuts where someone other decided where to place the camera. And this is on winter sports, something special and something different to do to me. Looking ahead, um, there is, of course, always discussion about climate change, uh, despite the fact that we can make snow. But uh, is this something that we have to think about? I mean, for example, the Swiss, so I understand, are looking to develop a downhill in Zermatt, which is at 1,600 meters. Uh, climate change, Finish. how might that affect uh, many of our winter sports? Michael, do you want to pick up on that one For first? For sure, if you look at Kitzbühel, which is 500 meters over sea level, if the climate changes like this in the future, in two decades, we will not have any race there if they are not able to produce snow uh, artificially. Uh, they are putting the snow on the hill already in November from their basins, which they created, where they have the water, and then they start... Uh, as soon as it's getting cold, they start to make the basic line for the race. So this is for sure a major thing for the future, which we have to have in our mind. How can we manage with all these climate changes to still have good winter sports? Also, you're further north, but uh, I've known plenty of winters when we haven't had too much snow in southern Sweden. No, no, that's that's true. It's it's an issue for us in in Sweden as well, and even Norway and and Finland. And and you know you keep snow from year to year, so you can use it uh, on the same track. So so I think we will see a lot of competition. Obviously, it's the, even today, but at the same places, uh, both because you can put a fiber uh, do fiber hubs on on the tracks, and then you can just keep snow and and make sure that you can have the competition on. On that same arena year after year but it there will be a challenging making it look good on tv if you don't have snow everywhere so um we're almost uh on time here but uh just uh, i'd like to go around with all three of you um one or two uh, things first of all um do each of you have some do's and don'ts about winter sports uh Florian, do you have a do's and don'ts uh, session? Do, do's and don'ts. In, in, in winter sport, I think the biggest do is, uh, as I said in the beginning, show the beautiful landscapes, um, in, in, invest in beauty shots, fascinate the people. Um, and as we've heard in the session before, always as a production, also invest in high motion cameras, show, show the moments, fascinate with it, beautiful, beautiful sports we are, we're all doing, we're, we're all producing, we're all loving. And I think the moments, really the details in those sports is what absolutely makes the difference. So my absolute do's are beauty shots and, and high motion shots. Also? Well, my must do is, uh, uh, like I said before, I think we have almost all the tools in the toolbox that we need to make a great production. But I think if you want to do the best storytelling, you need to really put the production staff together with the content staff and, and start working closely together. Uh, that has really been a success uh, at SVD. And, and I think that is something that we need to work even more on uh, for the future and not working in silos. And Michael, I agree with um, both of you. I think the most important thing is to bring, besides the sport, also the emotion to the viewer so that we touch their heart. That's the most important thing. And you almost asked, I was going to ask you also, just uh, as a, a final thought, uh, some tips or 
innovations that each of you have got in your mind for the future, be it this season or next? Uh, also, any uh, ideas you'd care to share for us? Uh, actually, and, and perhaps I shouldn't be saying this here, uh, we want to show more women's sports and that has been really challenging because you have the budget that you have and it's not increasing. So we're actually trying to, to make smaller production that works for linear TV and not only on streaming platform. So when, it, when we talked about ice hockey before, we're actually doing a two camera production on ice hockey for junior ice hockey and for women's ice hockey just to, to make that happen. So we often talk about the big scale, but I think we should talk about how you can produce sports in a great way with less cameras and less tools from the toolbox. Michael, innovations? I could follow all the thoughts. We also, everybody I think is focusing on women's sports, even in summer and winter. And uh, I think we have to try Keep the big things really big. There will always be more and more to add because of these icons and these are the powerful movers of these sports and of the winter sports. And keep smaller things small. Don't invest that much into the smaller things. So it's a, for sure two camera productions in smaller leagues and smaller sports is one of the future. But for me, as I'm used to work with all these big numbers of cameras, either in biathlon, either in the Alpines. I I'm always fighting for it because I think it's necessary and it's good to have it. And it gives a lot of power to the full sports this side of winter. And Florian, can you whet our appetite with something you're looking at introducing in the not too distant future? Um, obviously. and. Um... The thing we're working on is uh, what we've mentioned before and uh, what uh, the whole industry is looking into is uh, more remote productions. Also, in in, uh, in our case, we are already doing a remote production as the stages are 200, 250 kilometers sometimes away from the base. So it is a third of uh, remote production already. Um, but in terms of, um, of visible innovations, what the, the biggest difficult or the the uh, the biggest difficulty is we have at at the rally is, show, is to really show the cars when they're drifting from the helicopter we're too far away from the onboards um, you don't really see it so we're looking into a system um, to really show in gaming long term the um, the gaming perspective the gaming perspective ideally would be like two meters three meters behind the car with a wide angle um, obviously we have tried it with drones. It's good for a certain moment, but our rallies um, go over 20, 25 kilometers. That will be difficult. So our innovation, and maybe there's someone um, in the panel or listening here who has an idea how we can mount cameras at the back of, of the car where you really see the drifting in the future. And that's what we're looking into. Well, that's great. Um... To all of you, uh, thank you very much. Uh, just before we finish, I just want to mention that any of you uh, who sent questions in and we didn't quite get to them, we'll do our best to answer them offline. Uh, but uh, for now, uh, Orsha and Florian and Michael, thank you so much for being with us, for your input and ideas and creativity, and our best wishes to all of you for the remainder of this winter season and the Olympics and everything ahead. And Michael, uh, you're at the heart of it now. Good luck for your races in Cortina at this moment. Uh, but my thanks to all of you in this masterclass. Uh, thank you to all of you. Thanks, David.